so glad you could join us again on the stream as we continue to gather, uh, not physically, but gather together as a church. And I want to say happy Palm Sunday. Uh, next week is already Easter. And with that, I want to uh, read from Matthew chapter 21, verse 9. This is talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus to Jerusalem. And Matthew 21, verse 9 says, The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. family again. Not all in the same place, but with our hearts and our spirits joined together, we have the Spirit of God minister to us as a church family through His Word. Hope you've had a good week. A little different for all of us, uh, as not only our country, but the world faces a totally different situation. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, and let me get uh, you some updates on announcements. We're going to start back to our evening service this evening. So I invite all of you to join in at 6 o'clock. We will not be having music as part of our service, but we'll begin right in with our study of the Word at 6 o'clock. And we'll also be open to Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions or issues you'd like addressed, you can email in at ihcc.org. Or you can text, and they're going to put up on the screen, you text IHCC to 74121. And then you have the email, or you can send questions as well. So uh, we'll address that uh, this evening. Uh, we'll be also looking into the book of Romans, chapter 8, as we move through the book of Romans together. So I hope you can join us on Sunday evening for that. The church building is closed today. So there's no access to the building, uh, but through the week we have regular hours. Uh, so uh, you can uh, come in Monday through Saturday, uh, 
Sound Words is open. It's regular hours, except it's not open Wednesday night because there are no activities going on. All group activities, of course, are closed. Tuesday morning, the ladies do not meet here at the building, but they are streaming for the ladies. So you can tune in to Titus Tuesday uh, on the stream at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning, ladies. There's no Wednesday night activities, but Girls of Grace are encouraged to download and print their lessons for this week, and you can use the links. Get on the website, they'll give you a link. So uh, parents, you can direct your girls, although the girls are probably more able to do it than the parents. But you can download <laughs> and print your lessons and uh, be up to date for the Girls of Grace material. This is Easter week. Uh, Palm Sunday, as Andrew mentioned, Next Sunday's Easter Sunday, but we'll not be doing any special program. So our usual Good Friday service is canceled. And next Sunday morning, we'll be together in the Word, but we'll not be doing the usual special music that we do since rehearsals and that uh, are not able to be held. Your offering, as we mentioned, you can give online. You can uh, drop it off at Sound Words. Or you can put it in a bucket at home and save it up until we get back together again. Uh, you check the website to keep up to date for uh, everything that's uh, going on in our church activities. We pray for one another. Uh, we make contact with one another uh, through notes, through email, through phone calls. Uh, so uh, be aware. Uh, you can check in on those who may... Uh, have special needs. We have people going through physical issues. And though we don't have the virus, we may be blessed for that. Uh, let me read you a verse from Isaiah. You know, much of the conversation that goes on goes from despair to hope. And sometimes we as believers, you know, we have hope. But when we share with the world, well, and understand they are in a hopeless situation. Those without Christ are without hope. And even these kind of catastrophes are a reminder of God's judgment. And that the world is moving toward judgment. The scripture is clear. God brings all kinds of problems and disasters in because of sin to remind people that he is a God of judgment. Let me read you from Isaiah 45. I'll be reading the verses 5 to 7, but not necessarily everything there for time. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. And down at the end of verse 6, there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness. Now listen causing well-being or peace, and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Uh, in Amos chapter 6, the second line in that verse, there's a rhetorical question. If calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? So we often we have calls to prayer and so on. Well, then, see, what? What do these judgments and catastrophes remind us of? Reminded of how quickly the world could be overwhelmed. And God's hand is behind it because judgment is coming. Remember, we are moving toward the judgments of the tribulation. Those seven years preceding the coming of Christ. We're not in those seven years, but that's the direction we're going. And I just noted in Revelation chapter 9, verse 18. We have a series of seven judgments, three times, seven trumpets, uh, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And under just one of those judgments, the sixth trumpet, one third of the earth's population will die in the plagues of that judgment. So we see these many judgments, catastrophes, our wake-up calls, a reminder to God's people that this world is destined for judgment. And it's only God's grace and the salvation he provides that gives hope. And a reminder to the unbeliever 
that God is a God who is serious. In Isaiah chapter 45, God says, verse 18, Thus says the Lord who created the heavens. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. We'll talk a little bit about that later in our study. He established it and did not create it a waste place, formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is none else. And he goes on later in the chapter. There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. And God has declared, to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Ultimately, every knee will bow. But it will take the awesome judgments of God to bring it to that point. Some will bow for condemnation. Some bow in acknowledging salvation. Let's join together in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, the grace that is provided for life, for us as sinful beings. Lord, a world that is in rebellion against you, a world that is under the influence, domination of Satan himself, a world that persists in sinful rebellion, Lord, that grace that enables life to continue has been manifested in the fullest and greatest way by you graciously providing your Son to be the Savior. Lord, even in these days, we remember in a special way his coming to this earth to give his life a ransom for many. Your grace that provided salvation for lost sinners or even as we talk about the difficulties of this day and see a manifestation of your hand in judgment and calamity, it is a reminder that you were a God who is a just God, a gracious God, a merciful God, a God who in love has provided salvation, but a God who will bring catastrophic judgment on those who reject that salvation, do not bow in faith, in trusting in Christ. Thank you for the grace that brought salvation to each one of us. Lord, we are unworthy and undeserving, but because of your love, we call you Father. We know your salvation, and even in the most difficult of times, we have the confidence that you care for us, you're watching over us, and you guide us in each of our steps. Bless our time together today. May your word in song, and in our study. Encourage us, enrich our lives, Lord, conform us more to the glory of your own self. We pray in Christ's name, amen.
From the depths of the sea to the mountains, amen. Your power, Lord, it knows no bounds. A higher life cannot be found. So let the universe proclaim your great power, your great name. handy and we're going to go to Titus chapter 2. Paul's letter to Titus and the second chapter in your Bibles. We have been studying through this rather short book, a letter to Titus, one of Paul's young companions, younger companions, who was entrusted with the responsibility of helping the churches on the island of Crete to get more organized and established so that they could be protected against the error that was finding its way into the church. Uh, Titus began, uh, Paul began this letter to Titus, uh, calling himself in verse 1 of chapter 1, a bond servant or slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. And that's really what this letter is about. 
truth that produces godliness. God's salvation brought to us in Jesus Christ the gospel that Christ provided salvation by his death and resurrection is a salvation that produces godliness in the life. And so as we talked about, Titus is about godliness in the church. Godliness in the life of the individual in the church and godliness in the life of the church family. It takes the knowledge of the truth, the end of verse 1, which is according to godliness. You cannot separate the two. You don't try to have a godly life apart from the truth. It's the truth of the gospel that brings salvation, that transforms us on the inside, that enables us and empowers us now to live a life of godliness. And this is given by the God in verse 2 who cannot lie. That's why this is truth. Uh, it doesn't matter how many millennia <coughs> ago it was given. It's truth. God cannot lie. So that is the guideline and the standard. Uh, verse 5, he gets into the letter. Titus was left to Crete to appoint elders to oversee the flock of God. They are the pastors, the overseers. They have to be godly men and of godly character and men who know the word. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word so that they can exhort people in sound doctrine, build them up in the truth, healthy teaching, and also be able to discern and refute those who bring error into the church. And this is very important because verse 10 says there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, and they're coming in and having an influence in the church. This is where the danger always is when error that permeates the world begins to make its way into the church and the truth of God, God's truth, is corrupted, then God's people can get confused and that was happening in the church as it great because we were told in verse 11, these false teachers must be silenced. They're upsetting whole families, teaching things they shouldn't teach. So you see what happens. False teaching, error, corruption of the truth ends up having an impact on lives so that people's lives are unsettled. Now we have families that are at unrest and then pretty soon the church is brought into confusion and improper action. So that's what he's talked about down through... Uh, chapter 1. Verse 16 gave a warning about these false teachers. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him. In reality, they are detestable, disobedient, and worthless for any good deed. That's strong language. Remember, this is the Word of God. You cannot lie. He looks at the heart of those who have somehow made their way into the church, profess to be believers, that are teaching and living contrary to the truth of God. You know, see here, we are expected to know and understand and submit to the truth and put it above everything else, including family and friends. Remember, Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple if you love father and mother more than me. So Christ and the truth that God gives must be the guide of our lives. So we looked into chapter 2. In contrast to these false teachers, Timothy, you speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. We know that's healthy teaching, that word sound. We get the whole English word hygiene from it. I mean, it is healthy, health producing. It's a key word. We've looked at it. It's used about eight times uh, in the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Here, healthy teaching. That was mentioned up in verse 9. Elders are to be able to exhort in healthy teaching, health-producing teaching, the truth of God. This is precious. The psalmist wrote that it was more precious to him than gold, the treasures of the world. 
Your word is more precious to me than fine gold. We have to be careful that we don't hold it lightly. Uh, don't appreciate what God has entrusted us. In Paul's letter to Timothy, he told him to guard the treasure which has been entrusted to you. We have nothing more precious than the word of God, and we don't want to disassociate Christ from the word. Because all we know about Christ and the preciousness of the salvation he has provided is what is given to us in this book, the Bible, God's Word. So, Timothy, speak the things which are fitting for healthy teaching. That would produce healthy teaching. And you see where he goes now, the conduct. This is what flows out of sound teaching. You don't create that. You should have this certain lifestyle. Uh, and then you could come and learn the word. No, as you learn the word, it develops maturity in you. Uh, so he's going to give instructions to older men, older women, younger women, younger men, slaves. And he's going to talk about the transforming grace of God and the salvation Christ provided, which is foundational to all of this. It's foundational to godliness. So we talked about the older men. They are to be temperate, dignified, sensible. That's one of the key words uh, in these sections here. It, repeat, it gets re uh, mentioned uh, repeatedly. It was to be a characteristic of elders. It will be a characteristic of, it uh, doesn't matter your age, your sex. Uh, Sound-minded, uh, healthy in the faith, uh, in love, in perseverance. So, older men are to be godly men. You know, these uh, characteristics go along with what are required of elders. The qualities of elders are just the qualities of mature person. And all of us are striving and desirous of growing to greater maturity. But these are qualities that ought to be characteristic of us. And so the older men, temperate, dignified, sensible, healthy in faith, in love, in perseverance. Um, they have been established in the word, have become mature in their thinking and understanding of God's truth. So they have a settled trust in the Lord that governs their life. They live their lives trusting the Lord and demonstrating the love Remember the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. What the Spirit of God produces in the life of the child of God. The fruit of the Spirit is because of love. Um, that's what he's talking about here. Perseverance, endurance. And we sometimes say we want to finish well. And older men ought to be modeling a pattern of stability in their lot. The word perseverance steadfastness you have in your margin. Uh, two words where um, you keep at it under pressure. Uh, you're willing to live under the pressure. It's a characteristic of inventory. You think, oh, I want to run every time pressure comes, difficulty comes. You want a mature person who can manifest stability in the heat of conflict under the pressures of life. He's going to transition to older women. I mean, these are relative terms. Um, in ancient writings, they could be used. Here, they're comparative. Sometimes I'm going to use an older man of someone who's over 40, sometimes over 50, sometimes over 60. So it's not a fix. They're comparative here. And it might have to do with a congregation. Um, a new church established with new believers and... Uh, it may be when I came many years ago, there were less older people in years. Uh, many younger people, and uh, well, relatively many. Uh, <laughs> the people we had were younger. As we've grown, we have more older people, more younger people. But uh, what is to characterize the older people? This is what we want to measure ourselves with. Older women are likewise, and that term likewise appears through section in the pastoral epistles, and it denotes a 
comparison in the same way. Doesn't mean the older women are the same uh, as the men as male. They're still women, people, <coughs> but older women. Godly characteristics are to be true of them as well. Because it's the same salvation that they have entered into. It's the same Spirit of God dwelling in them. It's the same God producing His character in the life of the older man and the older woman. So you see, older women likewise are to be reverent. Uh, reverent is a word that has its basis in the work of a priest. But what it comes to mean then is uh, their life as a child of God, their relationship with God. Their life is to be lived in the context of their relationship to the God that they love and serve. They are serving God. Um, so it's not men serve the Lord and the women do the other things. We all serve the Lord and here the women are carrying out their lives with reverence, realizing what they do and he's going to go on. Some of the things we see here, they'd be out of character for a, uh, a woman serving the Lord. So they are to be reverent in their behavior. We're talking about conduct. Because remember, back in chapter 1, <coughs> chapter one the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. That truth that comes from the God of Kim and God. When it really becomes part of our life, through faith in the gospel, the truth of Christ's death and resurrection, we are changed on the inside, made new. So, now, godly women, they are reverent. Their life is service to the Lord. The negative side, they're not malicious gossips. I don't know whether I had to read the quote from John Calvin, the 16th century reformer, but I will. He says, the talkativeness is a disease of women, and it is increased by old age. Now, I didn't say that. I didn't even say that I agree with it. I just told you what John Calvin, the reformer, said. Malicious gossips, so we want to be careful. You know what the word is? Diabolos. That's the Greek word. Diabolos. You hear that? I mean, watching old westerns and somebody named the horse Diabolos. But it means a slanderer. It's usually used of the devil. Now that's its normal use in the New Testament. To refer to the devil. He's the slanderer. Well, for behavior that is to be reverent, that is functioning context of a relationship with God and serving him, you certainly want, don't want to be doing that which is characteristic of the devil. A slander. One who speaks evil and improperly. Um, so, you have to be careful. If you back up to 1 Timothy 5, and we haven't been going back and forth, but uh, he warns, uh, he's talking about younger widows here. But he warns them about being idle, and at the end of verse 13, they're not to be gossips and busybodies. I so want to be careful of that. And, uh, you know, in biblical times, uh, the women would get together at the uh, place where they did their wash. Those kind of settings might provide an opportunity for talking about things and people and they be improperly. So uh, their guard, guard against improper speech. I'm not saying that men can't speak improperly. Sometimes they do, and that's not right for a godly man. But here he's focusing on what he wants the older women to be careful of. They're not to be enslaved to much wine. And again, we talked about this with elders, and some of these qualifications seem to be rather, you know, slow, shallow. Well, you don't have to tell them not to be a drunk. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows that. 
But you know, what becomes acceptable in the world makes its way into the church. I spoke with a man who was on the board of elders of another church. And I would not consider that church an evangelical church, although the pastor was raised in an evangelical home, as he shared with me when I talked to him. But the man who had served on uh, the governing board of that church said we had to talk to him about coming into the pulpit on Sunday mornings under the influence of alcohol. Well, sometimes, you know, what becomes acceptable in the world somehow makes its way. So, uh, you know, we talk now. We're having problems with a virus. And alcohol sales are going up. And sometimes being in the home, idleness, at any rate, uh, they can't be enslaved to much wine. They are to be teaching what is good. It is just a compound word, teaching what is good, of the word teaching and the word good. And he'll go on to elaborate this, but to be teaching, which is consistent with the word of God. Um, they are not going to be teachers in the church. We'll look at that in a moment. But the realm in which they are teaching is to have an influence on the ladies they teach. To prepare them for the realm they're in. And this is one of the areas that becomes so controversial because the church, if it's being biblical, is so out of step with the world. Um, and it becomes more obvious and very obvious in our day. And you see the breakdown continues. It started out, well, women ought to have equality with men and that they ought to be paid the same amount if they do the same job. And there's no consideration, are women uh, <clears throat> different than men? Is male different than female? And for the world, equality means there is not. Although they don't fight that, uh, argue that consistently. But nonetheless, if you don't uh, say they're exactly the same, you're saying they're not equal. Well, even that argument is used in evangelicals. And that's where error sometimes gets into the church. Here they're to be teaching what is good, <clears throat> but their teaching is in the realm of helping younger women what? Understand their position. It could also help older women, perhaps who are new believers. But here he's talking basically in dividing up the group. And these are general categories and so on. If an older woman gets saved at an older age, obviously she's going to have to learn things uh, about godliness and her role as a godly woman that she didn't know before. So Paul's speaking in broader categories and terms here. So they teaching was good so that they may, in verse 4, encourage the young women to love their husbands. And that encourage is uh, related to that word we talk about being sensible. Um, it's not the word uh, like parakaleo that we think of often as um, encouragement, but sophronizo, and it's related to that word translated sensible. It means to bring someone to their senses, and then it can mean to advise them, to urge them but to understand, to enable them to help them think biblically. Um, so they act biblically, sensibly in a biblical context. They are learning something perhaps they did not know or hadn't been taught. Um, how to function biblically. And obviously, as young women come up, they're not going to learn in the world what the biblical but the Bible says they are to be. Where are they going to learn it? I mean, we talk about the women's movement today, and it is open and flagrant, but it's not new. Because remember, the devil has always been working to undermine and corrupt the truth of God in every area. So from time to time, different areas are more obviously under attack, so to speak, by the devil. But 
It was a problem in New Testament times. A problem in Old Testament times. But uh, Paul addresses it in a number of his letters. So much so that some who claim to be Bible teachers say, well, that's just his rabbinic background and the culture of the day that was influencing him and the training he had got. But remember, we're dealing with the Word of God who cannot lie. So this is God's truth. And that's just a way of undermining and trying to do away with the Word of God that you don't believe. But the danger of these kind of people is they claim to be believers. So we have what is called evangelical feminism. And I would say we get to have something of an oxymoron if, you know, they're just opposites. You cannot approach things from the thinking of the world and have biblical thinking. You have to start with the Word of God. So you're to encourage, help the young women to think sensibly, to know how to love their husbands. Well, you don't have to love. You fall in love or you're not in love. You don't have to learn that. You just, it happens. Not biblically. They have to understand how they are to love their husbands. It's just a compound word of husband and love. No. Uh, so there are things they can learn. What does it mean to love your husband? To see your relationship properly biblical. And again, there's difference that there's instruction for single women. They still have to be godly, but some of these won't apply. Women who don't have children, he's going to talk about children. They may be married, not have children. All those things, but he's speaking here again in the broad categories, the normal. Then we go to other points of scripture and he deals with matters perhaps related that would say, well, if you don't have a husband, this doesn't apply. But godly character applies everywhere. He's applying that godly character and conduct in the general situation that would encompass most of the people. Uh, encourage the young women to love their husbands. Uh, what does it mean to love your husband? To care for him. To take care of him. To encourage him. We sometimes go to Proverbs 31 and they use it for the woman working. But you know her husband is sitting in the gate. She's not sitting in the gate. Where the men who were leaders and influence, positions of influence in the city were. But she was a key part of that. And enabling him. And so here, how did the woman learn to love her husband? need to learn that. Young women, they're getting married. What's my responsibility? The world says, get a job, get out there, make something of yourself. Don't be tied to your husband. Don't let him dominate you. And you've got to be a free spirit. You've got to do your own thing. Your own thinking. Be your own person. You know, they grow up in the schools and are taught that. They go to the universities, they're taught that. It permeates everything. And uh, the home is, well, I, you know, I guess there's some people doing that, but they're just not the people. They're not the people we consider important and should be considered. How many people you see uh, on news and though that, that they're being interviewed because they have such a great home? And it's not what the world admires. The world is at enmity with God. And the people of the world are. They must learn to love their husbands, to love their children. They say that's natural too. I mean, you know, motherly love is just an instinct. What is beyond that? These aren't just emotions that happen to come out. What does it mean to love your children? Take care of them properly. The book of Proverbs gives instruction on raising children. part of Proverbs on the, the influence of the woman particularly. And we close on that. Uh, what does it mean to love your children? Take care of your children. And they went, oh man, I couldn't stay home with a kid. I just couldn't do that. That's not... Well, wait a minute. What, what is it? Well, you know, we've created an environment. If you don't get out of that, somebody else can take care of the, women, uh, the children. I mean, you know, anybody can take care of the kids. 
And besides, if I had to stay home and take care of the kids, I'd go crazy. Well, wait a minute. Maybe they need to learn to love their children. Um, well, I love my children. I just don't want to spend all day with them. <laughs> well, maybe there's some things that need to be taught, things given to appreciate that true satisfaction and fulfillment will come from fulfilling the role God gives you. Now, obviously, if uh, a husband and wife, God doesn't uh, plan that they don't have children, then, you know, there'll be adjustments on uh, what she does, and, uh, things that will fall upon her in the home, and so on. And, uh, but the general pattern here that encompasses most. To be sensible, verse 5, there's that word clearly brought out. I mean, it's to characterize uh, the older men, they are to be sensible. Is to characterize the elders, they're to be sensible. You see, God wants his people to think soundly, you know, soberly, correctly. And that means we think biblically. Our first thought is, what says the scripture? What does the scripture say? And uh, we think sensibly. Then we have a balance. Things aren't out of the control in my life. I've uh, got my mind together, my thoughts sensible, uh, pure, um, proper kind of thinking, um, pure thinking, which would be biblical thinking, godly thinking. we got our minds. So we have to be careful. You know, now so much can come into our homes with TV and internet and everything else. We just bombarded almost incessantly with the world's thinking. We're in Romans, when we get to chapter 12, we'll have to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the making new of your mind. You know, our whole thought processes. You know, I have to be careful. I just continue to take in what the world says, what the world thinks. And, you know, I begin just to make adjustments to fit that. No, I must remain my thinking as sensible, pure. Workers at home. Uh, it doesn't say she can never be outside the home for anything or never work outside the home. And obviously, in some situations, she will. Um, you know, if she's not buried, she can probably work outside the home. And that becomes natural. In some situations where she is, she may work. The point is, this is her realm, and she has to be careful that's taken care of. Uh, again, uh, she doesn't have family. That gives her a freedom for other uh, things and other involvements, always consistent with what she is as a woman. But uh, that's her realm. That's why back in 1 Timothy chapter 5, where we were a little bit ago, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he says in verse 14, I want the younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house. That word keep house, combination of the word we trans we just transliterate into English, despot, and the word house. To be the despot of the house, the master of the house, the ruler of the house. Now under her husband, that's, we're going to see that in a moment, but that's generally her realm for the woman. That's what God has ordained. Again, it doesn't mean she can never be outside the home or work outside the home, but has to be careful that that realm is taken care of. Give the enemy no occasion for reproach, for some have already turned aside to follow the devil. So you see how Paul and the Spirit directing Paul, wants this. this is foundational material for godly living back in Titus chapter 2. Workers at home, kind. I mean, this whole realm, uh, I'm going to work through this and we're going to want to look at a couple of other passages. Again, these are qualities and characteristics of any godly person. It's just a reminder. The older women are teaching the younger women and helping them to think biblically that these are the qualities that are characteristic. You know, the world wants the woman to be like the man. 
be strong, uh, be brass. I mean, look at the language of the world. It seems the more profanity you use, and Grant, you think so, you know, it used to be, you think of the men, I worked at the steel mill when I got out of high school. And uh, you learned some language you didn't know was used in English. But my parents didn't use it at home, and uh, they didn't use it in school. And uh, I remember one day, I was late with some papers that had to be turned in for steel to be rolled and that. And the man uh, enabled me to learn some language that uh, I hadn't learned before, <laughs> uh, that I should not repeat. Uh, young women are to be kind. I think uh, the women now, okay, we talk like the men. But of course, if something doesn't go well, then we have the Me Too movement because men took advantage of men. That if men and women are the same, it's just you fight it out. Men usually don't say, well, that man took advantage of me. But, uh, you know, these things the world does because they constantly want to fight and reverse the roles. Reverse the roles. So you add more emphasis on how the man ought to be submissive and how the woman ought to be in. And, oh, we don't have anybody in this position in government. We're still waiting to have a woman be president. And uh, we're going to, you know, quality like kindness. How often do you hear, well, oh, yeah, you want the woman to be kind. You have to tell the men to be kind. Yeah, we have to tell everybody. But he, God here is addressing the women. And the older women ought to be teaching the younger women these qualities. They're not going to learn it in the world. Being subject to their own husbands. Now here we are at the uh, real area of conflict. The word subject is the common word to be subject, to be arranged under the authority of someone else. It's used in a military context. And using other things. It means you're under the authority of someone else. Um, they are to be subject to their own husbands. Um, this is God's plan um, from the creation. Now, I'll be careful here. I want to make you alert. They're talking about a marriage here. Some people say this only applies in marriage. Back up to 1 Timothy 2. And here Paul has talked about what he wants the men to do. They say, well, he's going to spend more time on the women than he did the men, but he sent and the whole letter on the men. He's talked about what godly men ought to be to be elders, but every man ought to ascribe to godliness, not just elders. But certain of those godly men will be appointed as elders. Certain of them will be deacons. We have many godly men who are neither an elder officially or a deacon officially in our church, but still meet the qualifications and have the qualities of godly men. So that's something we all aspire to. We're seeing that with some of the qualities laid out for older men, now older women. I mean, these are just godliness. They don't do away with the distinctions God's created. So you have that word likewise in verse 9 of 1 Timothy 2. Because he told the men he wants them to pray. And the women, I think of when the men the church meets, the men are to lead in prayer. We have evangelical churches, even our own city, who don't follow that. Uh, the pastor who pastored here for many years, who did a sermon, the tape was passed on to me, using my sermon as what he would disagree with. Uh, well, we have to come to the Word and wrestle it out. I want the women to adorn themselves properly in their clothing, not just with external. doesn't mean that they can't fix up. doesn't mean they don't wear clothes. It just means they don't follow the world. Their grand concern is the inside. Uh, but verse 11, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. They said, well, this is the church. Now, Solomon started with one of the presidents of an evangelical school. Maybe it didn't start with him, but it was how it gained great popularity because of his influence. Well, this was a cultural situation of a specific problem, and the problem was at Ephesus, at that time, the ladies weren't educated. And so they weren't qualified to teach men. So you see, now we begin to take parts of the word we don't agree with and say, well, it just applied to that time in that culture. 
But you understand, this revelation from God was closed about 2,000 years ago with the book of Revelation. It was all written at a different time period, and that sense in a different culture. So that means that we can become the authority just to discard whatever we don't like. Well, that's just that culture. Well, that was just what was going on in that time period. And where do we stop? I read on the deity of Christ by a man. His writings are accepted in evangelicalism, but I don't think he was truly saved. I've read his biography. He said, well, that's true, calling Christ deity. I mean, you had Roman emperors that had to have down through time. And other people who want to be honored as God, the Pharaohs. And, you know, that doesn't mean he was truly God. Well, wait a minute. Was that just that period of time and the influence? So, so we want to be careful here. Verse 12, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And he's talking about just in the church. It could be true if you're married, that a wife is missing to her husband, or in the church. But other than that, it does not apply. But what does he use to establish this? Verse 13. For it was Adam who was first created in Eve. There was no church in the Garden of Eden. I mean, the very order of creation establishes the hierarchy. God created Adam first and then Eve. That establishes the order. It must be recognized. No, God, uh, the, God does not say the world's going to recognize it. They're in rebellion against him. The church must. His people must. I mean, it's like in the Old Testament, Israel, where the people of God, he had chosen that nation. He gave them his law. They were bad. He doesn't send the prophets to tell the Babylonians to start functioning uh, according uh, to what God says. Or to the Assyrians, or to the Philist. I mean, of course they come to God's people. The only call to the world is, turn to me and be saved. As we read in Isaiah 45, call the earth. Turn to the only God who is the only Savior. Now your conduct must conform to godliness. So believers will go back to the opening chapter of Acts, uh, Genesis. <coughs> How did it start? God created Adam first, then Eve. And he summarizes here. He uses other arguments in another passage we'll go to. And it was Eve who was deceived and fell into transgression, not Adam. No matter whatever you want to do with deception, the fact is those truths about the fall into sin. Adam wasn't deceived. Eve was. It's used as a reason why the woman isn't to teach or exercise authority. So now, well, does that mean the woman is more susceptible to deception? Was that just the historic fact? Whatever those you come to, the very those very facts <coughs> that Adam wasn't deceived, but Eve was, support the point that she is not to be the teacher, she is not to be an authority. These facts precede the existence of the nation Israel. They precede the existence of the church. This is what we call creation mandates. It's like marriage. Marriage is what we call a creation mandate. It applies to everyone in the world. And it was recognized and is recognized to one degree or another. goes back to what God established. It applies to everyone. And everyone who disobeys, it's in disobedience. God addresses his word to his people and tells the disobedience about those who don't belong to him and says that should not be your practice. That's what it means. You don't get conformed to the world. Now, we have those who claim to be evangelicals. Again, I... How much of the word can you deny and still claim to be an evangelical? One who believes the gospel and the truths of the word of God. I would say, well, the opening chapters of Genesis are not to be taken literally. It follows the pattern of the day. We're back to culture 
those things. Um, so the best we get is, you know, in time, God brought out of theistic evolution a man and a woman. Well, the Bible builds on that. What did Jesus say when they asked about divorce? Have you never read in the scriptures? In the beginning, God created a male and a female. That solves it. Can we talk about Christian homosexuality? No. They say, you never read the scripture? Christ took it literally. He wasn't confused. In the beginning, God created a male and made a female. What don't you understand? What don't you understand about the implications for marriage on that? I mean, if we don't go back to the word as our authority, we're just out here groping like the world and we grab onto some things and we're constantly trying to make adjustments so we can fit the world so we get along better. God's goal is not to make us fit the world. It's got to make us different than the world. You know the things he did with Israel? Marked them off and made them strange so the rest of the world around them just hated them. Because they were different. People hate the Jews today. They're different. People hate the church today true believers because they're different. But sometimes we're not different. And Jesus said, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. Well, that's what they did for the false prophets. So we want to be careful whose approval we were looking for. So uh, this is what it puts. Um, verse 15, the woman will be presented for preserved, saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. There we go. (coughs) Those are godly conduct. Her realm will be the home. Um, That's become the (coughs) the Old Testament. God established Israel. There were no female priests. He establishes the kingdom. There are no female kings. Except one queen, Athaliah, but that's in an ungodly conduct uh, context. Nobody recognizes her as a godly. That was part of the rebellion that was going on against God. I mean, certain things are established. Come to the church, its elders. Leadership is established as male. Uh, I think that permeates. I was asked in a meeting of pastors, well, we got a conservative woman and a liberal man. Who are you going to vote for? In other words, you're asking me that maybe if I think both are unbiblical, I just don't vote. You're asking me would I vote for someone I well, yeah, I would vote for someone I didn't think was biblically qualified. Not that they have to meet all the biblical quality game, but as far as leadership, I believe leadership is male. I would not vote for a female or president. Happen, and if a woman gets the way of president, I will submit to the laws of the land. It's like I do when an ungodly man's appointed. But remember, the prophet said, Lord of God's judgment, who gives women and children to rule over them. Now, it doesn't change the fact. People go to Galatians 3. Well, in Christ, there's neither male nor female. Now, the way of salvation is the same for men and for women. The salvation that a woman receives is the same as a man receives. But it doesn't change her from being a woman, nor does it change a man from being a man. So uh, the principles established here come back to, uh, well, come back and go through Titus and come to Peter. There are many passages, and uh, I want to get a little further on here, so we won't go any more of those. But go to 1 Peter chapter 3. But you just see, this applies whether a woman is married to an unbeliever or a believer. Uh, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 1, rather. And you note the context. Often this is in the context of being a servant. The servants or slaves or household stewards are all under the authority of someone else. So back in chapter 2, verse 18, servants be submissive to your masters. We're going to talk about servants or slaves uh, in a moment in Titus. Because he pulls together these, they're, they're, they're both under authority of others. So here he puts the servants first, 
then he'll use the example of Christ. He's going to talk about the women and their being under authority. Then he's going to talk about slaves. Then he's going to talk about uh, the uh, authority of Christ and the work of Christ in Titus. But look at chapter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that any, any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won by the word, without a word, by the behavior of their wives. Just live godly. Doesn't mean you can never talk, but you don't wear them down by nagging him. They observe your chaste and respectful behavior. They're respecting because your husband. Just like we respect the rulers that are in place because they're the ruler that God has put over us. May be the most ungodly. We understand Nero was the ruler. Uh, when uh, the New Testament would have been written and Peter writes, Paul and Peter both going to die at the hands of that godless man. Vile. Him and his people came to the They couldn't take him anymore. But all they have to say is be respectful to the leader. Uh, verse 13 of chapter 2 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether the king as the one in authority or governors as sent by him. Well, well, I don't agree with them. Well, they tell you to do something that is unbiblical, you can't do it. Otherwise, you do it. You don't obey them because they're respectful. You respect them because God has put them in the position. So the wife respects her husband because he's in that position over. Your adornment must not be external. And they have our English Bible put nearly because that's obviously there because you're going to put on things. <coughs> which is the last part of verse 3, don't let it be putting on clothes. Well, obviously, you put on clothes as part of the uh, you know, chaste and uh, modest. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. An opportunity uh, when a woman has a husband who can be difficult, she manifests what God has done in their hearts that enables her to do what is pleasing to God. And sometimes, you know, you look at a person and say, I don't know how they put up with that. Because God gives special grace to those who submit to Him and commit to doing His will, they draw on His power. In the same way, in former times, holy women also hoped in, who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. That's the mark of godliness. And then he uses Sarah, obeyed Abraham, and called him Lord. Say, well, we're getting a little bit now. That was in that day and that culture. I mean, Abraham's 2,000 years before Christ. That was a different culture. That was a different day. The women were almost slaves of their husbands. Come on, give me a break. You don't expect us to do that today. Well, do you accept the writing of Peter here as the word of God or not? So we begin to dismantle part of the word, then we have to dismantle the other part. We decide we're going to be consistent, so we become consistent with our inconsistency, and pretty soon the word of God has no authority in our lives. There's the example. And this is talking about an unbelieving husband. You say, well, Sarah at least had a godly husband. Yeah, who put, him, put her in an Egyptian pharaoh's harem and lied. Even the pharaoh was aghast when he finds out what he's done. I mean, he's not necessarily admirable in everything he does. She called him Lord. Do what is right without fear. Verse 6, you trust the Lord. And then there's a word to husbands. Live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she's a woman. That's not a put down of a woman. Recognize what God says about a woman. She's not made to be a man. She's made to be different. Oh, she's inferior. No, and I usually use the example of pots and pans and dishes. Little kids like to pull out the pans and pots and pans from under the sink and rattle them around. You don't put your fine china down there and like, so don't play with those pans here. Use these dishes. No, you put them up where they don't get it. Is that because the dishes are inferior? 
What do you mean inferior? They were created, they're made, they're created for something different. They're not made to be thrown around like a pan. I mean, we don't want, we want the world to control our thinking. So men are to be godly. They show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Not because she's just like a man, but she's experienced the same saving grace of God as the husband has, if he's a believer. So he starts out with an unbeliever, showing me you, your concern is to be what you should be where God puts you. If you have an unbelieving husband, my concern is as a wife to be a godly woman under the pressure of being. That's the same way he talks about with slaves, Peter did in chapter 2. You may have a totally unfair, uh, difficult master. That doesn't change your conduct. I mean, it's all right for me to sin because he's a bad sinner. No. Lord, you put me in this pressure. I learned to trust you in ways I wouldn't have learned. Um, that doesn't excuse a man mistreating his wife. I'm boss here. I make the decisions you don't. Be quiet and do what I tell you. That's not a godly man. That's an ungodly man trying to use the scripture to support his ungodly desires. You know, those things are true for everyone, but in our day, we want to walk on eggshells lest we say something, and I uh, know I've even had phone calls, you don't love women, you don't care about women, you just are, and oh, Indian Hills, that's that church that hates women, and this is not so. God doesn't hate women. He provided a savior for women, just like he provided him for men. He created them to be everything he wanted them to be. And he created men as male to be everything he wanted them to be so they would complement one another, not conflict and compete with one another. It's sin that has brought the mess that we have. Come back to Titus chapter 2. All of this is done so that the word of God will not be dishonored. That's it. I'm reading the mind. A woman cannot be disobedient to her husband and be a godly woman. She dishonors the word of God. She is unfaithful to the God she claims to serve. Period. Unless he's telling her to do things that are clearly unbiblical. I want you to commit immorality. I want you to go shoplift for me. But those aren't the issues we really deal with except in exceptional cases. They just don't like it. That's why it has to be taught how to love their husbands and their children. And by taught these godly characters, men have to learn how. How do I help my wife be what God has created her to be? How important is it that I be everything God says I should be so I treat her as I should as a fellow heir of grace and appreciate her as the woman God made her to be? I mean, this is what Titus is about. And this is where these things are in the context of a book where he's concerned the church is being moved off of its commitment to God's truth and the godliness that comes from that. That's what he's talking about here. He flowed right out of this because of teachers who were having an influence upsetting whole families. And in verse 16 of chapter 1, he said they're detestable, disobedient, and worthless for anything good. And here you teach the things for healthy doctrine. And it gets right into conduct in the families, because there's the families being upset. I mean, <coughs> we want to be careful. We don't avoid these things just because, well, I just don't know if I'm comfortable with that. If I'm comfortable with the Word of God, I need to make an adjustment. The Word of God doesn't need to be adjusted. It doesn't adjust to me. I adjust to the Word. Likewise, verse 6, urge the young men to be sensible. And that's Saul. Saul. One of our men that I was having a conversation with, he said, well, that's the best we can hope for young men. Uh, they'll be sensible. But he's not done. He's going to use an example of a young man, and that's Titus. You note the sentence goes on. Then urge the young men to be sensible. We've already talked about that. You don't have to elaborate. He's repeating these, but now he's going to use Titus as an example. Because compared to Saul, Titus is a young man. 
in all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds. Uh, you should be the example. So it's not just older men that we should be an example young men or older women to young women, but we want this to be permeated because we'll have others that are immature. And all they show yourself to be an example of good deeds. And then with purity in doctrine, soundness in doctrine, there's our word again, healthy in doctrine, uncorrupted truth. And as Peter would talk about it, a newborn babe long for the pure, unadulterated milk of the word. Same idea. Here we have healthy in doctrine, in teaching, dignified. We saw that with the uh, qualities of elders. There needs to be a seriousness, not a gloominess. But a seriousness. We're about business here. And part of elders is the church is not going to become a place of entertainment, and godly men would not want it to be. There's a certain seriousness about what we're called to do. And women are going to hell. God has provided a Savior to change lives. They must have healthy teaching built into them so they can be godly. Sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, verse 8. Why do we do this? So that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. You see, that's the concern. Well, the unbeliever will slander us. The devil is the diabolos. We don't want to join forces with him, as he told uh, the older women. Uh, and then for the men, we're not to be slanderers. That's the mark of ungodliness. Uh, but, we don't want to give them an excuse because I don't conduct myself properly. So your speech is beyond reproach, so I shouldn't say what I shouldn't say, even when I'm with unbelievers. But you know what those I have? You know, he talks just like us. Yeah, he says just like us. He ran down the boss just like we do. He jumped right into that. He likes the dirty joke just like we like. He, you know, he, he talks just like he does. we do when he's with us. That doesn't mean you have to have holy speech. But you want to be careful. Wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, first and foremost, I'm a child of God representing Him. I don't want to pull myself down to fit in a long sense. doesn't mean I can't talk about the football game with them. I can't talk about, you know, uh, things of common interest. But I don't want to go where they might go with things. My speech has to be honorable, beyond reproach. And slaves here. Let me wrap this up quickly. Bond slaves, it's our word slave. Uh, be subject, there's our word. Same word used for the women, to their husbands. Uh, subject to their own masters in everything. We know that Peter talks about when you have a, an unfair. You know, some masters could be overbearing. Their requirements could just be not you know, you couldn't do it. And they could beat you for it. That's my excuse not to be respectful. It's like we have rulers that might do what we don't agree with. Well, they ain't on it goes. Be subject to their own masters in everything. Be well pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith. Conducting ourselves faithfully, consistent with what we believe, so that we adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. That's what we're concerned about. We get concerned about the person, you know, a slave, about the master. Lord, in this situation, how can I be a godly person with a master like that? God didn't know what he was doing when he put you in that position. I mean... You know, Jesus said that. What, what, do you, what thanks do you have if you do good to those who do good to you? Everybody does that. You know, scratch my back, I scratch yours. Pad my palm, I pad yours. You know, that's the world. A believer stands out when he may be receiving something huh. that he doesn't deserve. He's been mistreated. That would be a slave. You show all good faith. 
so that you will adorn the doctrine of our God in every respect. The end of verse 5. For the young woman's conduct, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. This is what it's all about for all of us. Men, women, male, female, older, younger, male, female, doesn't matter. Slave, master. You know what the number one thing is? Godliness. Lord, you've redeemed me by your grace. I deserve nothing. He's going to come to that in chapter 3. We deserve the judgment that the unbeliever is getting. We are recipients of God's grace. I am a manifest. What has God put up with me? What did he put up with me? What is he putting up with in the world? You know, you know, look and say, I couldn't take this. I'd wipe the world out in a moment. But he doesn't. Why? He's patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. These calamities come. He brings them. Why? Remind the world judgment is coming. You're not as secure as you think you are. You can be gone in a day. Turn to me and be saved. I've provided a gift for you. It's free. Believe in the Savior I've provided. And I'll cleanse you, forgive you, make you new on the inside and give you an eternal security. Uh, we don't want to lose focus here like oh boy how are we going to get through this this virus could overtake us our country will never be the same it could <coughs> we were strangers and pilgrims here that's how we live I'm not glad we're suffering I'm not glad for what we go through naturally I'm not looking to suffer so when the Lord takes some of the comfort away now is my trust in him shaken? I don't even trust you in good times, Lord. You understand this is not a very good time. Well, we went through the book of Ecclesiastes. Remember, you had no cha- uh, control over the future. He controls the future. It's his time to determine when is the time to live, when is the time to die, and on it goes. Oh, you know, I have to think sensibly. We just blow by these. Now is my time to think sensibly, soundly, uh, to focus on the truth. Be sure, yes, I have settled my eternal relationship with the living God. That's where he's taking us now in verses 11 to 15. That's the basis for all this. Now we live securely in an unsecure world. That's why I started out in the announcements I mentioned. I want to be careful as a pastor. Some of these evangelical pastors get interviewed and they just want to say, well, we have hope. We want this country to have hope. And there are better days ahead. This reminds me, there are terrible days ahead. This world needs to understand there is a God who is graciously, patiently offering you something may not be available you, to you tomorrow. You may be gone. The door may close. Today is the day of salvation. And we as believers want to walk with that security. Otherwise, we get caught up in the confusion of the world, blown around, unsettled, fearful. And we miss the joy and privilege of having inner peace and tranquility because the peace of God stands God in our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that's what biblical truth does for us. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the riches of your word. The greatness of the salvation you've provided in Christ that overcomes the wretchedness of our sinful condition, the hopelessness of life, the fears that come. Lord, we are secure in you. Pray for any who are listening today. If they have not trusted Christ, perhaps they grew up in this very church. The godly parents went to Sunday school went to youth group, maybe were baptized here. But Lord, they're lost and without hope in the world. Their life is empty. They don't know the security and joy and peace you bring to our hearts. May this be a day of salvation for them. May all of us as your children live confidently knowing tomorrow is under your control 
and be cared for us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.